Okay, so um, the second part uh, of my uh, lecture is uh, on solving single agent problems. Um, so I want to uh, start by reminding you of the examples that we talked about before where I said I would, I would promise you I'll prove it later. Uh, so if you imagine an allocation constraint uh, y hat like 1 minus q, um, we talked about what the optimal interim mechanism was for this allocation constraint uh, for a single agent with a public budget. And that was essentially take that constraint and iron the top, which means average it, so move some mass from high types to low types. And then at some point, reserve price it to not allocate to some low types at all. Okay, um, and we said that importantly, where you iron and reserve price depends on where the budget binds. So these locations of these places where you iron depend on the allocation constraint that you started with, because that's how you tell where the budget binds. Um, for unit demand uh, agents, so in particular for a unit demand agent with two items and a uniform distribution, uh, we saw that actually things were quite different. You just sort of greedily allocate to the highest quantiles until you decide to reserve price. And you keep the exact same allocation rule as the allocation constraint until you reserve price, and then you just throw everything else away. Um, and that resulted in this picture in the two-dimensional allocation space uh, for, the, for the agent. Okay, so the main thing I'm going to do today is uh, uh, do in, in this talk is derive these two results. Uh, I'll start with, uh, the, the, so the agenda is the following. Um, so uh, the first thing to do is to solve the public budget uh, single agent problem. Um, and I'll just use, the ex again, the example we've been talking about as my example. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is solve the unit demand single agent problem for cases like uniform 01 where things are nice. And the last thing I'm going to do is show that in cases where things are not nice, which might be like general product distributions, um, so these, are, these will not generally be revenue linear, um, I'll show you how to approximate the unit demand single agent problem. And from these approximations of the unit demand single agent problem, the framework I presented in the last talk is modular. So if I want to throw in an approximation mechanism in place of the optimal mechanism, when I reduce from multiplayer to single player, I can do that. And that'll just add to the approximation factor. Okay, so uh, you'll be able to use these with the, which will be nice and, and uh, simple, uh, with the theory we developed last time when you want approximation mechanisms. Okay, um, again, my goal is a unified framework in which to think about these that looks a lot like the single dimensional linear theory. So it's going to look a lot like optimized virtual surplus, which we're very happy with. Okay, so the uh, public budget single agent problem. Um, so again, that problem is there's an allocation probability, a payment, a private type, a public budget, and the utility is your uh, surplus minus your payment if you don't pay more than your budget and you really do not want to pay more than your budget. Okay, my example before is uniform zero one with a budget of one quarter. Um, okay, so the uh, result that I have to show you is the following. The optimal single agent mechanism for an interim constraint y hat is the all pay rule where you iron the top and uh, the reserve price the bottom. Okay, I'm going to assume a regularity assumption, which I'm not going to state, um, but you'll see in pictures what that means on, in, in later slides. Um, and what do I mean by the all pay rule? I mean that there's a deterministic function which maps your bid to a payment regardless of whether you win. That's what I mean by an all pay rule. So your payment is always deterministic. Question? Yeah, two questions. Uh, you showed us this in the context of a budget constraint. Yep. You mean the same thing by an interim? I'm confused about your language. That's the same thing as an interim constraint? Oh, I didn't mention um, budget. This is for the public budget agent. Sorry, my theorem statement should have said public budget. So you've got a player with a public budget. Saying the public budget is an interim constraint. 
No. Um, there are two kinds of single agent problems I want to solve. There's the uh, ex ante single agent problem, which means I give you the problem, which is there's a uniform distribution with some budget. Okay. And I want you to find the optimal mechanism for that uh, distribution over preferences uh, that sells with some ex ante probability. The interim allocation problem is given a single agent uh, uh, preference and distribution, so public budget with a uniform distribution of our value, say, um, I would like to, for any interim uh, allocation constraint, find the optimal mechanism. Right. So for any okay. dashed line here, I want to find the black line, which is what to do. Is that good? That's good. Yeah, I okay. Was no, I, I, I uh, you're right. I admitted it from the slide. I should have said public budget agent somewhere. And just out of curiosity, I did, this is uh, two different papers, the Lafont and Robert. This one paper. Lafont and Robert, and uh, they did exactly this. Uh, the proof I'm going to give you is, and the statement of the theorem is different. Right. Because and the, the yeah, so they just said, what if I had m multiple players that are IID, how do I solve the optimal auction for, with budgets, public budgets? Okay, but you can look at what they did and apply it to solve this problem, it. and it'll give you this solution. Okay, yeah. So um, I have one agent. This is all the money he can spend. Exactly. Uh, if I have several agents, they'll each have a budget. Okay, so uh, if it's an, a symmetric environment, I'll be assuming they have the same budget. Okay, so so it's, it, it's not just they spend money from the same port. That's correct. Public budget means this agent, their preferences are defined by a value for the object and a budget, which is how much they're willing to pay. That sort of defines okay, so one agent's public preference. Public means that everyone knows it. Yes. Okay, okay I'll just kind of get confused over this word. Private value. We don't know it. Public budget, we know it. Thanks for asking that question. OK, is everybody clear? We want to solve a single agent problem, given an allocation constraint, find the OPL mechanism. We want to show it looks like this. OK, so here's the uh, proof approach. I'm going to write just the mathematical program as you would write it. I'm going to Lagrangian relax the budget constraint. I'm going to look at my objective and I'm going to express that as a Lagrangian marginal revenue. Okay? Once I've expressed it as a, a Lagrangian marginal revenue, I know how to optimize marginal revenue. So I'm just going to employ the solution that optimizes marginal revenue applied to this Lagrangian marginal revenue. Okay? That's our agenda. Sorry. Oh, no problem. Okay, so what's the mathematical program for the single agent public budget problem with an allocation constraint? I want to optimize over the allocation rule and payment of my mechanism the expected payment and expectation over the distribution of types. Subject to the allocation rule and payment are Bayesian uh, are incentive compatible and individually rational and they produce an allocation rule that's feasible for the allocation constraint y hat. And the payment of the player, and I've just written it for the highest type, the player with the highest type doesn't pay more than b. Okay? Uh, payments will, of course, be monotone, so if, as long as the highest type doesn't pay more than his budget, none of the players will pay more than their budget. Okay? So that's the problem. I've got the usual problem, which this would be the the usual single dimensional linear problem. Just add the budget constraint that the high type can't pay more than their budget. Good. Now let's relax that constraint and put in the objective. Okay? So what I'm going to do now is just ignore the fact that I have a budget at all. I'm just going to try to look at what optimal auctions look like that optimize objectives like this. Okay? The optimal one will have to choose lambda carefully so the budget is met with equality if the budget is binding. Okay? But I actually don't care about that. I'm just going to tell you what they all look like, and then you can find the right lambda that meets the budget with equality. 
Okay? So I just now want to interpret this as a Lagrangian, I'm going to rewrite the objective as a Lagrangian marginal revenue. We know how to rewrite a payment as a marginal revenue, so this is going to be pretty easy. Okay? But the way I want to do that is I want to think about um, the way we derived revenue curves in imagining the question of what would happen if we posted uh, the price that corresponds to the quantile Q. Right? If we post that price with the single dimensional linear agent, they buy with probability Q, and we get a revenue of Q, the number of people buy, times the price we post. Right? But now with this Lagrangian objective, what happens? Well, we get the payment. Uh, this term is a constant, so I ignore it, drop it from the program. It's not going to change my outcome. And uh, I get minus lambda times the payment of the highest type. OK? Um, so uh, if I were to post price V of Q, what does my objective turn into? Well, in general, I get P of Q, and then what does the highest type pay if I post price V of Q? Highest type pays V of Q. So the payment of the highest type is V of Q, so it's minus lambda V of Q. So I have a two cases here. Why do I have two cases? Because if I'm posting some Q that's strictly bigger than one, then some player buys, and the highest type has a payment. If I use Q equal to, uh, did I say one? Strictly bigger than zero. If I use Q equals zero, though, if I want to post the price that corresponds to the highest type exactly, he's indifferent to buying or not buying. I'd rather have him not buy, actually. Right? Because if he buys, I get zero, because zero times a price is zero. Right? So this term is zero. But then I just lose this Lagrangian term from him paying. Right? So it's going to be discontinuous where I have the option to have the high type not buy. So this is my Lagrangian price posting revenue curve. So I'm going to draw pictures of this. So for the uniform distribution, the regular revenue curve is just the quadratic function. That's P of Q, the original Q times V of Q. And remember, V of Q is 1 minus Q. So that would be that quadratic. I'm subtracting lambda V of Q which for the uniform distribution is just a straight line from lambda to zero. Okay? And so I get this curve which takes the dotted curve and the straight curve and adds them together and gets this dashed curve. Okay? Except that it's discontinuous right here. It's actually zero at this point. Right? At, at Q equals zero. OK, good. So now I have a revenue curve that I would like to optimize. Well, we know, and, but this revenue curve, you notice, is not actually monotone because it, it has a discontinuity. It drops here and then goes up. So what I should do first is iron it. What does ironing do? It takes the concave, uh, concave upper bound, which actually what it's going to do here is just flatten between this point and where it's tangent to the curve. Okay, so ironing the point here with this curve is going to just take the smallest concave function that's above it and, and do that. Okay, so how do we optimize that? So can you say again why it's bad the discontinuity? Yeah, the discontinuity is because if I look at this objective, Q minus lambda V of Q, that came from the fact that uh, this is the V of Q is the payment of the highest type. When I'm offering the price that is equal to the highest type. The highest type is indifferent between buying and not buying. I'm going to choose as the designer that he's not buy when he's indifferent. And therefore, my revenue when he doesn't buy is zero, and my cost for the budget constraint is also zero because he does not buy. So you're using I'm choosing a particular tie-breaking rule for that case, which happens to be the right case thing to do for optimizing revenue. OK? Good. And if we're optimizing this, we know exactly what to do, right? Because we're going to basically iron where we've ironed the revenue curve. And we're going to reserve price where it becomes flat. And so that looks like ironing the top and a reserve price. 
And what we need is a concavity assumption that on the Lagrangian price, uh, this P of lambda, that says that at the places where you didn't iron in the beginning, it's already concave. So that regularity assumption is what's going to give you the fact that there's only the ironed interval at the top and the reserve price. It could be, for in general distributions, that there's some irregularities here too, in which case you get more ironed intervals. Right? Okay. That is what it is. But for the regular case, it's going to look like this. Okay? Um, and just to put that picture back up, that's what it looks like. You iron the top, you reserve price the bottom, and it's because of that simple analysis. It's basically doing um, the uh, uh, Bula, Ro uh, Bula Roberts to the LaFont Robert proof. Okay, so that's that. Um, now let's look at uh, unit demand single agent problems. Okay, so just to remind you of the setting, uh, M items, we have an allocation, which is a probability the player gets any item. We're unit demand, so we require that the total probability that the player gets an item is at most one. Um, and there'll be a payment P. The player has a private type that lies in some type space, which I'll imagine is M dimensional. <coughs> um, their utility is linear. And their type is drawn from a distribution with a density. And I'll assume whatever nice things I need to assume. OK. Um, so two examples, single dimensional linear, which I'll uh, remind you of in a second, is m equal 1. And the two item uniform we've been talking about is m equals 2 with the type drawn from the uniform distribution. OK. So um, I'm actually going to go through the single dimensional thing again because I want to talk about another way of viewing what the single dimensional analysis is doing, which will enable me to generalize it. Is there a question? It's just one agent flight, right? Again, this part of the talk, I'm only talking about one agent. Okay? In the previous talk, we showed how to reduce multi agents to solving the single agent problem. So now all I have to do is solve the single agent problem. Okay, um, for this particular case, I'll have uh, item symmetric distribution, in which case I'll just study the part of type space where T1 is bigger than the other items. The type for agent one is bigger. I'll condition on that and look at the alpha mechanism there. And the alpha mechanism overall is just the same thing duplicated in, the, in every region. Okay, that'll be a simplification. Okay, here's some motivation for this question. What I'm going to basically do is prove uh, the thing that Eric was asking me to do before, which was prove that this projection to a single dimension where you only ever get your favorite item, that's the optimal thing to do. That's my goal. Okay, so that's actually really a statement about second degree price discrimination. You have multiple objects. Maybe you're selling software packages and you can have like a professional version and a student version and a whatever version, right? And the thing that we're going to do right now is identify the conditions on the distribution under which second degree price discrimination does not help you. Even if you could do it, you don't want to because the optimal thing doesn't sell ever, ever the sort of lesser items. Okay? And once I condition, as I said I, I would do for symmetric distributions on knowing which type is the higher one, that's exactly there's a favorite item. right? And that's the best version of the product. And don't sell the guy the worst versions of the product. OK? OK, so um, I'm about to prove uh, or describe settings where a second degree price discrimination does not help you. OK, so I just want to remember the intuition for why second degree price discrimination could help you. OK, and so think about airline seats and business class versus economy class. Why, does second, why do they have two prices and two tiers? Because these, the high-valued people are very sensitive to the quality of their ride. Right? They're much more sensitive to the quality of their ride, relatively, than the low-quality people. And if that's the case, then you can get a lot of surplus from the low-value people off, offering them something they want. And 
uh, a higher, much higher price for the high quality things. So you offer the low quality thing at a low price and the high quality thing at a high price, and you can extract surplus uh, more than you could just from a single price. That's the intuition. Okay? And the thing I'm going to prove basically is that the opposite of that means you don't want to do it. Okay? So if the high quality people are less sensitive to quality, then the high value people are less sensitive to quality, then you don't want a second degree price discriminate. Okay? So an example of that maybe is um, when you go to the movies, the movies are all the same price. Why are they all the same price? Because mo movie buffs don't actually have more ability to spend money on movies than the average person, right? And so they're the ones who are super sensitive to which movie they go to, but they don't have more money to spend, so you wouldn't benefit from secondary price discrimination. Okay, um, good, so that's what I just said. Um, and as Eric suggested, then the single dimensional theory is enough and I should not waste my time even writing down multiple dimensions in this case. I should just look at the favorite item and use my single dimensional theory to study that. Okay, good. So what we're gonna show is that. Good, uh, it's, it's actually, as I stated it that way, but it's sort of a distributional version of that, meaning there are more people who are like this than like the other. I do not have, well, I, uh, I will be able to prove that this kind of item, this kind of auction is optimal in some large uh, settings. And when it's not optimal, I'll identify approximation. I'll show that simple things are approximately optimal. Um, I haven't got proofs using this framework of exact optimality outside of this scenario. Although it's something that I think might be possible given some recent insight I've had, which is in these slides. So it could be that this is the starting point for more general proofs. Um, but it's stuff that I, you know, worked out in the last week. So <laughs> when I had to post the chapter of the book, so it would be posted for you guys to read after this. Exactly. Um, good. So I'm going to do a bunch of warm up solving progressively harder versions of the problem. Okay, so I'm going to start with something that was in a paper by Mark Armstrong. Um, which is, let's uh, optimize the uniform 0, 1 case, which was our starting example, and let's do that by um, conditioning on a ray from the origin, optimally solving the problem on the ray, and then hoping that we get something that when we uh, look up the other rays is consistent. Right? So here's the thing. I'm going to relax all the IC constraints except the constraints on, one, on this ray. I'm going to solve the problem. I'm going to hope that this relaxation doesn't, come, doesn't mess me up. And in fact, there, I, I'm going to hope there isn't a you know, deviation from someone not on the ray to someone on the ray or something, right? So that's what I'm hoping. I'm relaxing everything but those IC constraints. I'm solving, and I'm hoping I get one thing that's consistent. OK, so let's let f max denote the distribution of type 1, given that type 1 is greater than type 2. So if I condition on being in this interval, it's just a distribution of f1 unconditioned. Okay, um, so for uniform 0, 1 squared, what is the distribution of f max? Well, it's z squared. The density is 2z, right? It's the probability that you're uh, above um, the other guy. Okay, uh, don't work it out. I did. Um, so I want to condition on the ratio of the types, T1 to T2, which is conditioning on the types being on a ray from the origin now. OK? Notice that conditioning on this, the distribution of the highest type is still F max. So good. Now I've conditioned that I'm just studying the ray, okay? And uh, I want to compare two questions. I have this multidimensional type where I have value t1, uh, and I can allocate it with probability 1, with probability theta, with probability 0. This is the ray with slope theta. Or I have two items. One item you have value t1 for, and the other item you have value theta t1 for. But theta is a fixed known public parameter. 
Okay? And I claim these are identical scenarios. Theta might as well just be my probability for allocating to you. Um, and I'm sort of allocating the damage good, which is always damaged by a known amount theta. Right? And we know that the optimal auction for a, a single probabilistic item is to never sell the probabilistic item. We always sell deterministically by posting the price, that's the monopoly price for the distribution. And the monopoly price for this distribution happens to be the price we were talking about before, square root one third. Okay? This uh, optimality of this is uh, often called no haggling, and it's in th this sequence of paper studying the single dimensional setting. Okay? So that's just no from knowing the single dimensional setting, and because it's on array, things become so easy. We don't have to do sort of any new math. We can say we know what it is. Good. Um, so now we've solved this single dimension and determined that the price is one third. Notice the uh, price is square root one third. Notice that didn't depend on theta. So if I looked at every ray, the price is square root one third. Okay, and you only want to sell the favorite item. Okay, well there's a mechanism that does that. So relaxing these constraints didn't violate any incentives. Right? I just post that price of square root one third and I'm optimal. Okay? So in other words, whenever, if you have a mechanism problem, you condition on some information, and you get the same answer, regardless of that information, that means that thing is just optimal, unconditional. That's exactly, I only sell the, uh, uh, mm, so look, so imagine uh, one is the red car. And imagining I'm just looking at the type space where red car is a favorite car, okay? And imagine I look at the case where we're on a line from the origin, so your type for the blue car is always just a fixed parameter theta times your type for the red car. It's worse by theta less than one, okay? In that case, the fact that I have two cars is the same thing as if I were to probabilistically allocate you the red car, right? And we know something about probability allocating the red car. We know we never want to do it. Okay, so that's enough to prove that we just want to post the price for this, the deterministicness of the single dimensional problem is enough to prove that we're, we're done. Exactly. So I did this for the region of space where red is better. But red and blue are symmetric for the uniform 0, 1 distribution. So the same thing is true for the blue car. And so I want to post a price of square root 1 third for the red car when you prefer the red car and square root 1 third for the blue car when you prefer the blue car. We should just post the price of square root 1 third and you pick your favorite color. Okay? Which is what I claim should be optimal for the ex ante or for the unconstrained problem. Right? Unconstrained, you should do that. Furthermore, let's suppose I have some uh, cost for allocating the item. Then what happens? What happens when I have some cost is I put that cost in here where I have zero currently. I price at the inverse virtual value of the cost for allocating the item, right? Well, that gives me then a number which is going to be, again, the same number for everybody. So regardless of the cost, I have the same posted price. Good. That tells me I might as well interpret this as the virtual surplus, and now I can solve the, the general interim constraint problem using relating cost to the allocation constraint, essentially. So I said that fast, but it's, it's all very straightforward. Once you project it to a single dimension, you're, you're done, and everything follows the same way as the usual single dimensional theory does. Okay, good. That was my warm-up. Okay, so... Um, Challenges for generalization, well, we have to consider other paths from raised from the origin. Things aren't going to look just like the single dimensional case. So we're going to have to get around that. And um, then we need to solve the mechanism problem on general paths, perhaps. 
And there's something I didn't write on here. When I go to, so I'm first going to generate from raise to pass, and then I'm going to go from pass to just the distribution over type space. Okay, so when I go to distribution over type space, I'm going to have a, an even more uh, uh, difficult problem because I have to know what path to use. Okay, so that'll be an even more problem. But for going from raise to pass, um, I need uh, a, a more general theory. Okay, so uh, here's what I want to do. So as, as I told you, I would like a theory for multidimensional mechanism design that really looks a lot like the single dimensional theory. In other words, I have a way to map uh, types of players to virtual types, and then uh, somehow the virtual surplus is equal to the revenue, and I can optimize virtual surplus point-wise and get something that's incentive compatible, and then that's the optimal mechanism, right? Some miracle. So relaxing IC constraints, solving for virtual surplus optimization, and then I get back and I check and I haven't violated IC constraints and we're all happy. So I would love for that to work. So I just want to write down what it means to love for that to work. Okay? So I would like a, a, uh, a vector field that maps types to virtual types that has the following properties. Property one, it's an amortization of revenue. Okay, the expect for any incentive compatible mechanism, the expected virtual surplus of that incentive compatible mechanism is at least its revenue. Written in math, uh, expectation number types, of the product of the multidimensional virtual value and the multidimensional allocation rule for that type is at least the expected payment in expectation over types. Okay? That's what it means. Why do you call that amortization? Uh, that is going to be on my next slide. Um, so an amortized analysis is an analysis, and we, we in computer science use amortized analysis all the time, where we want to get credit for things from other things that we know we have to do also, but keep track of credit in sort of a funny way. Okay? So we're going to do an amount. So virtual values are essentially keeping track of revenue in a funny way. It lets you attribute the revenue of a type uh, to the, lo that lowers the price of other types to serve it, but also gives you some revenue from serving it. So let's kind of calculate that and put it on the type. We'll, we'll see that on the next slide. Okay? Um, and that's why I call it an amortization of revenue. Um, I'll call this, uh, this vector field incentive compatible if the pointwise virtual surplus maximizer is incentive compatible. So when I just take this thing and I optimize it, I get something that actually you can implement with a mechanism. Sorry, one more time. What are the constraints in this optimization problem? The ex post feasibility. That's it. So you draw, you basically you write, you, you try to map revenue into virtual values, and then you drop IC constraints and optimize uh, virtual surplus subject to feasibility. Right? So for a single player that's unit demand, that would be the sum of the XIs is the most one. Okay? Good. I'll call the, uh, the vector field tight if its uh, virtual surplus is equal to the revenue for the virtual surplus maximizer. Okay, so in other words, this inequality, I required it to be at least in general, but for the virtual surplus maximizer, I want it to be equal. Okay? And I'm going to call this vector field a virtual value function if it satisfies all three of these conditions. Okay, and then the proposition is if a virtual value exists, then the virtual surplus optimizer of that virtual value function is the optimal mechanism. Why is that? Uh, well, if it exists, point-wise virtual surplus maximizing is incentive compatible. Let's look at the revenue of that. Well, it's tight, so its revenue is equal to its virtual surplus, which is at least the virtual surplus of any other allocation, which is at least 
the payment for any other incentive collateral mechanism. Okay. So this is how virtual values are used. I just wrote down what we needed to be true so that we could use them like we always use them. Okay. And the really great thing about virtual values when they exist is that they reduce the optimization and expectation of revenue, which is something that's sort of hard to get your head around, to something easy. It's a point-wise optimization of the virtual surplus. Right? You would ignore IC, you just optimize this function on the input you have, and that's it. I am. Okay, so I want to answer Eric's uh, question about why do I call this an, optimiz uh, an amortization. Um, and for that, I want to return to the single agent problem where it's sort of easy to describe the pieces that are uh, moving around. So remember, uh, the virtual standard virtual value function is this, uh, the type minus the 1 minus the CDF over the density. That's the usual formula that I assume you've seen before. Uh, if, if, uh, if you haven't, it's the same as... Wonderful. So you've all seen it before. Okay. Um, good. I want to consider some intuition for this. I want to basically do an amortized analysis where I charge the agent with type T the benefit I get from serving price T instead of not serving him and only serving the next higher guy. Okay. And the point is um, I gain something from the types in the interval between t and t plus dt, right? In fact, uh, what did I gain from them? I gained basically t, okay? And those types uh, show up at probably f of t, okay? My loss is, well, from every, every other guy, I had to lower the price, okay? So um, from the types bigger than t, um, they were paying me a bigger price, and now I lowered the price. Right, so my loss is dt, the amount I lowered the price, from all those types that are bigger than the price before. Okay, what's the, how many of those types do I have? One minus capital F of those types. Okay. So this keeps track of the total revenue I have from any mechanism. Uh, and it keeps track of that revenue at the each, each type. So the net uh, that I have from this type is I just added these up, right? I get um, T times uh, uh, density of T minus the loss, which is 1 minus capital F of T dt. OK? Yes? Uh, the gain. So if I am, so imagine I, I'm trying to say what is the benefit of selling to this guy, the guys in the interval t, t plus delta t. Okay, so imagine I'm not selling to them before. So if I sell to them, they, then I, I, I basically lower the price to t. Okay, then I'm going to get t times the, how many of them there are. Okay, okay. <coughs> but I lowered the price. I lowered the price by dt for everybody above, so my loss was 1 minus capital F of t dt. So the net is this, and I claim integrate that over the type space, and you're done. Okay? So the virtual surplus is integrate net times allocation. Notice that um, I can rewrite integrating net times allocation by dividing by the density and then calling it an expectation. So I want to turn an interval into an expectation. It needs to be the integral with respect to the density. So I'm going to divide and multiply by the density to divide by the density and then multiply by the density. Then I drop the density to call it an expectation. And I get the familiar formula, which is that, which is this divided by f of t, because I divided and multiplied by the density. Okay, and you guys know why these are good and everything. 
And I call this an amortized analysis because I'm basically keeping track of the revenue I'm getting, which is P, locally at each decision I'm making, which is going to make it easier to keep track of the revenue. Awesome. And you guys know that. The uniform distribution has that. OK, great. That was a good review. Why I call it amortized, uh, amortiz amortization of revenue. Good. Now I want to consider another special case, just a path-based agent. Um, I'm going to put this into quantile space, because quantile make space makes everything sort of geometric and intuitive to me. So I'm going to parameterize my path by quantile. So um, I'm imagining there's a, pa a path in type space which maps quantile to the type you have. Okay, and then I draw quantiles uniform zero one, and the type is equal to the the point on the path that you're quantile. Okay, and as usual, high types have quantile zero, low types have quantile one. For strong types are quantile zero, weak types are quantile one. Good. Uh, this is a decreasing path in quantile. Non-increasing. Yeah, it says, yeah, I wrote that. In both dimensions. In both dimensions. Okay, let's just assume that, so when I, if I were just look at dimension of item one, I could ask what drawing Q and then plugging that into th th uh, this path function and saying what is the distribution of the, your value for item one. I want to assume for simplicity in this talk that these induced distributions are regular. Meyerson's regularity condition. Okay, so if we threw out the other item and looked at your just in one item, you would have a nice regular distribution for that one item. Okay, so um, I have lost some subscripts. Okay, so the revenue curve for uh, item J is Q times, and this should have a subscript J, the Jth coordinate of the path function. Okay? Um, and the marginal revenue is you differentiate this with respect to quantile, and you get the marginal revenue. And um, remember, for decreasing paths, the derivative of the path is negative. So this is actually you're subtracting something. But it's because this is a negative, you're going down the path, so that's a negative number. Okay? And Q, um, uh, T prime of Q corresponds, when you look at virtual values, Q is 1 minus capital F, and uh, tau prime is 1 over F, when you're in a single dimensional case. Okay, so these should have all had subscripts. I apologize. Okay, I'm going to, I claim the following. If I define the vector field, which maps each type coordinate-wise to its marginal revenue, uh, to its mar yeah, to its marginal revenue. Okay, and so I'll define the marginal revenue of a profile of, uh, of, of a quantile to be, the, this is a, now a vector, equal to the individual components of the marginal revenue. Okay, I claim it's an amortization of revenue. Meaning, for any IC mechanism, expected payments is expected, marginal re uh, expected virtual surplus. Okay, this is like the dream, right? The dream is you go to multi-dimensions and just the projections of the single dimension are the thing you want. I want to point out that that dream kind of has to be right. Why does it have to be right? Look at a mechanism that only allocates item I. The virtual value better be the item I virtual value in the single dimensional case, otherwise you're not keeping track of revenue correctly because that's the only way to do it. Okay. So somehow, if there is a virtual value function, it better be this one. Ah, so I actually said it was an amortization, and I remember I'm keeping. I I have this terminology that I always I always misspeak uh, when I say it. I often misspeak. So it's only a virtual value of all of these things hold. Right. Okay, it's an amortization until I prove these things too. Okay, so, but I'm, I will probably make a mistake and say virtual surplus instead of amortized surplus. And so I apologize if I do. I'm so used to saying virtual surplus is the thing I'm optimizing. But it's hard to change, change now. 
Okay? I want to prove that. I'm actually going to prove it's a tight amortization of revenue. Um, what does that tightness mean? Well, tightness was that other bullet that virtual surplus is equal to revenue for the virtual surplus maximizer. I'm actually going to show virtual surplus is equal to revenue for anything as long as the smallest type has a binding IC constraint. So the utility of the lowest type is zero. A binding IR constraint. Okay, so uh, good. Good. Um, so I'm going to start by looking at utility of the player. So expected utility of the player, just integrate the utility of the player for every type they have over the distribution. Okay, I'm going to multiply that thing in the integral by 1, dq over dq. I'm now going to integrate this by parts. Okay, I'm now going to swap out the derivative utility with respect to, to the path uh, at the quantile q dq with factoring it into the gradient of utility time in each dimension times the derivative of the of the path in each dimension. Okay, so I just swap this out for basically applying the product rule for multidimensional functions. Okay, where that's the dot product, the gradient dot, the change in the types. Okay, I'm now going to employ a theorem due to Roche that says that uh, an IC mechanism, the utility is convex, and the allocation X is the gradient of utility. To change this to the allocation X. Okay, so now I have utility is equal to the utility of the lowest type minus this term, but now remember tau prime is negative, so that's actually a positive term. Okay, so the utility is utility the lowest type plus something. Okay, let's write the revenue now. Revenue is surplus minus utility. Uh, let's combine and simplify. Okay, so we could pull the x out and its coefficients, and we get tau plus q tau prime minus this utility. This is exactly what I wanted because if I assume the weakest type has binding IR constraint, meaning they have zero utility, that's zero, and my revenue of any IC mechanism is exactly equal to the dot product of the allocation rule with what is this? The multidimensional revenue curve, uh, marginal revenue curve. Okay, that is the R primes. Right, where that's just, remember R was Q times tau of Q, so product rule. Good, so that's the theorem. Okay, so I've proved that this is an amortization, and I proved that it's tight. I now need to understand when, when I pointwise optimize the amortization, the amortized surplus, I get something I see for free. Okay, I wanted to find this condition ratio monotonicity, which says that uh, in pictures, the rays from the origin cross the path from above to below. It says that the curve is always steeper than the path to the origin. Okay, meaning the change in the coordinates, which is the steepness of this curve, is bigger than the path to the origin, the difference in coordinates, the ratio of coordinates. Okay, I just said in math what the picture says. If you don't like the math, look at the picture. Okay, uh, theorem is, is this is incentive compatible when the path is ratio monotone. What does a ratio monotone path mean? The higher your type is, the more indifferent you are between the alternatives. It's exactly what I said it would mean. Okay, 
So how does this proof work? Um, I use that inequality in the definition of the marginal revenues. And basically, I'm able to prove that this inequality holds. What does this inequality say? Um, shoot, those should all be marginal revenues, so primes. The marginal revenue of item J is less than the ratio in values between the two guys, the two items, and the marginal revenue for item one. Okay? Item one is the favorite item, so this is less than one. So your, your virtual value for the favorite item is always more than your virtual value for the other item, as long as it's positive. So positive virtual value, favorite item has higher virtual value than other items. Negative virtual value, also negative. What does that mean for point-wise virtual surplus optimization? I optimize virtual surplus point-wise. If the favorite item has positive virtual value, it's going to be the biggest one. I'm going to serve you that. I have a unit demand constraint. I can only serve one of the items. I'm going to serve the one and all of it that has the highest virtual value, right? Or nothing if there's only negative virtual values. So either the favorite item has the highest virtual value or they're all negative. That's what this condition says. Which means virtual surplus optimization always serves the favorite item. Well, if we're always serving the favorite item, we know the conditions under which that's IC. I just need the revenue curve to be monotone and I assume regularity. Question. That is an awesome question. Sorry, what, what was the question? How far is the theorem from if and only if? So what I'm going to do is I had that path. So when, when I define paths uh, for you guys, I'm not going to put up a definition. When I define paths, I also told you the distribution implicitly with quantile. But you can imagine taking the same path and changing the distribution just by drawing quantiles differently or something. That will give you the same path with a different distribution. Okay, so here is my sort of if and only if part of the condition. So given the, if the path is not ratio monotone, okay, then there exists a distribution, a regular distribution, such that the favor, selling the favorite item is not optimal. So meaning redoing how I uh, or distribute along the path to put the best thing to do in one place, I can make it so that it's not optimal to post the price of the I favorite item. So if I want to say, for what kinds of paths, does no matter what the distribution is, I optimally sell the favorite item, if and only if it's ratio monotone. So let me show you the proof of that. It's uh, very similar to Thanasoulis' argument, uh, showing that uh, posting a uniform price is not optimal for a player with two values drawn uniform 5, 6. Um, basically, what I do is Thanasoulis. Um, so uh, what I do is here's a picture of a path that's not ratio monotone. I'm going to put the monopoly price for item one right in the middle of that non-ratio monotone part. Notice the line from the origin crosses from below to above, not ratio monotone. Okay. And then I'm just going to calculate what happens if I also offer the price uh, T2 minus epsilon. So I kind of drop that price and I, I, I set a price down there. Okay? If I only offer price T1, all of these types buy and they pay me a T1 hat. Right? If I also offer this price at T2 minus epsilon, what happens if I post a price? Well, people who only want that buy that and the people who want both break their indifference when the difference between the price is, is equal. So it's a 45 degree line. This is not ratio monotone and we are in the region of type space where player one is best. So a 45 degree line will eventually cross the non-ratio monotone line. Okay, of course this horizontal line also crosses. Um, and so now I just need to calculate what is the benefit from offering this lower price and the loss from offering the lower price. Okay, and so the gain is that these green guys who were not buying before now start buying and pay me T2 minus epsilon. Right, the green guys 
We're not buying here. Right? They start buying and they pay me T2 minus epsilon. The loss is these red guys who were happily paying me T1, which remember is bigger than T2. It's the favorite item. T1 is bigger than T2. Those guys are going to switch and now pay me T2 uh, uh, minus epsilon. So the loss from them is they stop paying me T1 and they start paying me T2 minus epsilon. And then you just take the fact that it's ratio, not ratio monotone, to get a contradiction and to show that the gain is actually bigger than the loss and post a price is not optimal. Okay, excellent question. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Okay, so. Uh, I meant your last question. This one I'm sure is also good. <laughs> Uh, so this is a unit demand agent. So um, a unit demand agent is substitutes. Oh, okay. yeah, so it's, it's so, but, but this is not all substitutes. So this is not true for all substitutes, but for some class. Some exactly. Sub so I need ratio monotonicity. Without ratio monotonicity, I can't prove. So, even th so as comparing to our... Yeah, it's not all substitutes. Unit demand is not all substitutes. That's correct. Unit demand is a special case of substitutes. That's correct. That's correct. Cool. So I want to talk about the, uh, so I, I solved the warm up, which was uniform square with race in the origin. Um, that had to solve the race in the origin. I then wanted to generalize that where I'm going to have to solve paths. And so I showed you how to solve paths. Okay. I now want to solve general distributions over the part of type space where item one is preferred. Okay, I'll do m equals two. Okay, and I have Brochet's theorem. I'm going to use it in a second. Um, so, this amortization of revenue is really related to something that was being done in uh, Roche Chonet, although they didn't exact. They do it exactly like this. Um, you write uh, revenue as equal to uh, surplus minus utility as usual. You integrate by parts on paths to write the utility in terms of the grading of the utility. Um, and you regroup to write this as a virtual value. That's basically what we did for the path. You do that again in multiple dimensions, just integrating over paths. Um, of course, as you would guess, there's a degree of freedom in choosing which paths you want to integrate over. And here's the thing. Any set of paths will give you an amortization of revenue. Okay? That just follows right out of the calculus. Okay? But it's not the case that any set of paths, when you then optimize the amortized surplus, will you get something I see. So some care is needed to figure out if I'm going to do integration by parts over paths, which paths to choose. So I'm going to do sort of a light version of, of what's in uh, my paper with my uh, former student, Nima Hagpana, who's now at Penn State. Um, in the paper, we give a method for leaving the paths as variables and then looking at what we want to be true of our, of our, our virtual value function and using that to pin down what paths we need the only pass that could possibly prove that this amortization is a virtual value function because the only pass that could make it IC to optimize point-wise. So I'm not going to do that here. I'm going to do a, a lighter version of that where I guess the paths using a kind of obvious in hindsight guess. It's giving me the same result. However, the more general uh, framework gives results in cases where I don't know what a good guess is. Okay, so um, this framework applies also to additive agents. And uh, in the paper, we use it to solve additive agents um, with 
irregular distributions even, and the, I don't know a good guess for that case besides solving it. Okay, the unit demand case, things happen to work out nicely. As you saw, the virtual values I got for pass were very intuitive in terms of stuff I already knew, and that's super helpful. Okay, um, good. So, uh, the right paths for integration by parts are what I call the equiquantile curves. In other words, the probability that uh, type 2 is below the path conditioned on the value of T1 is constant in T1. Okay, so I look at every T1 and I ask, what is, I want to find the T2 such that the probability that the type is below the path conditioned on T1 is equal to some constant, say, theta. Okay, that'll give what I call equiquantile curves where the quantile is in the conditional distribution of T2 given T1. Okay, I don't want to go through the sort of algebra you need to, to show this. The equiquantile curves have the following property. Uh, so this is the theorem you get. Oh, I, the, they have the following property. If you condition on a type being on an equiquantile curve for some uh, for some constant theta, say, the distribution of type 1 conditioned on being on that curve is the unconditional distribution of type 1. Okay? In other words, the way I define these curves deliberately doesn't give you any information about type 1 if I condition on you being on one of the curves. And that's because I define the curves to be constant in uh, type 1. The probability of type 2 is constant in type 1. So I give you no information about type 1 conditioning on these curves. If I give you no information about type 1 conditioning on these curves, then if I optimize in every curve, the optimal thing for type 1 is the same distribution, so it's the same posted price, which is what I need to combine things across different curves. Okay, so why is this a good guess? Well, I know that if I want to be able to combine things across curves, I better have the same conditional distribution. Okay, pick the paths that give me the same conditional distribution. And those turn out to be the equiquantile curves. Okay, and then the theorem you get is, in general, the favorite item uh, projection is optimal if the slope of the equiquantile curves are ratio monotone. Okay, I look at these curves. If they're ratio monotone, then I can solve the single player problem and I get posted pricing, as we saw from the path analysis before, right? And we're done. So what does that mean about a general distribution? For a general distribution, the types are weighted so that there are more people with high types that are less sensitive than there are with high types that are more sensitive, right? So it's sort of mass is shifting upward as we get higher type one. Okay, that is the general theorem. Absolutely. My understanding of how it relates to the only literature is. So, Schoen and Roche, and Roche, I don't remember what's where, they come up with some, you know, that theorem that you had, Schoen and Roche, that they basically have no idea which constraints to bind them. That's correct. Which, you know, what the pattern that they tend yeah. to and the theorem they actually write down is conditions on the optimal mechanism, and this theorem actually holds for any mechanism. Okay. Right? So that's th the big difference between this theorem and what they wrote down is they sort of are looking for conditions of the optimal mechanism. And I just want to know how to, how to think about the surplus of any mechanism. Yeah. Richer way of guessing what the parts were, and then when you extend it beyond this case, yeah. what, then I'm guessing that you, as I understand it, you said you can't guess and verify, you don't know exactly which yeah. constraints are binding, but then you're doing an approximation of yeah. that isn't available. To so when I extend, it. so uh, there are extensions beyond this that still give optimal mechanisms. 
Okay, so the extension in the paper is to additive preferences with pricing the grand bundle. Which if you think about it, is kind of like selling the favorite item. But I'm assuming a product distribution, uh, not assume, I'm assuming a general correlated distribution over items and your values added up across the items. And so in that setting, we get a general theorem, which is actually very similar to the stuff that uh, Sergio Hart was talking about. Um, but uh, in our paper, we get uh, uh, sufficient conditions for optimal pricing in the grand bundle. And I do not know of any lucky guess of pass. I mean, I could see what the pass are because you get them in, when you do it, right? But I don't know of a nice way to have gotten them beforehand. And um, to give you a hint about how this works, in two dimensions, it's pretty easy because the pass sort of tell me what the virtual values are, right? And I know what the virtual value for item one needs to be. It needs to be the virtual value for item one unconditioned. So that's going to give me a differential equation that lets me solve for the virtual value of item two, such that it satisfies all of the things you need things to satisfy for integration by parts. That's uh, more information than I intended on giving you, but that's what you do. And so that gives you sort of a procedure. If you want to show a certain kind of mechanism is optimal, and you want to show it's optimal by virtual, uh, by optimization of virtual surplus, how, are you, how is the only way you're going to get the virtual value function that's going to do this? Okay. Good. But that leads me to all of the settings we didn't cover so far, which is all of the settings where, um, you know, there, so we know that optimism sometimes randomized. When they're randomized, there isn't a virtual uh, surplus function. It does not exist. Um, so we would like to come up with good mechanisms there as well. Okay, um, I'm going to have a brief interlude uh, and talk about an awesome math question coming from the literature on optimal stopping theory, um, which is a stochastic, online stochastic optimization. And uh, this, uh, the year I learned this was the favorite thing I learned all year. Um, and it's sort of a five minute back of the envelope calculation you can do. So um, if you learn one theorem in my talk, this is actually a pretty good one to learn. And it has nothing to do with anything I talked about already. So if you tuned out, you can tune back in and just pay attention for five minutes. Okay, I want to consider the following stopping game of a gambler. Um, a gambler is going to face a sequence of n games. The prize in game i is drawn from distribution fi. Um, the gambler does have prior knowledge of these distributions. On day i, the gambler i plays game i. What does he do? He draws the prize from the distribution and has to choose to take this prize and go home and quit and never play the game again or give up this prize and play again the next day. There is a huge literature on this game and variants of it. Yeah, good. So I'm going to connect this to approximation and auctions. Um, and you're going to see it's going to be exactly the theorem we need. The theorem I get, it's going to be exactly the theorem I need. It's yeah. I don't want optimality, exactly. Um, so uh, how should our gambler play? Well, the optimal strategy is kind of a complex thing. Um, let's uh, set a threshold TI for whether we should stop with each prize. Um, and then I'm going to solve it with backwards induction. On the last day, I always take the prize. On the next to last day, I take it if it's better than my expected value from the last day. So that's my threshold. And then I calculate the expected value of that, and that's my threshold for the, previ the, next, the previous day, et cetera. Backwards induction. Okay, so I don't like this solution very much. It's very complicated. Um, I didn't learn very much about what good things do besides monotonicity. It is monotone. Expectations are increasing, so I get lower prices, uh, lower thresholds as I go. Um, it's not very robust. What if I change the specification of the problem a little bit? Like I reorder some prizes? Things all change. Okay, um, and I don't learn anything about variance of the game. So I'm going to look at a different strategy for playing this game. I'm going to look at fixing one threshold t. And I'm just going to play the game and take the first prize is bigger than t. And even on the last day, if the prize isn't bigger than t, I am not taking it. That doesn't matter, but 
It just makes things worse for me. I'm going to show something, even if I'm doing that stupid thing of not even taking the prize on the last day. So, so the gambler doesn't get to choose which order? That's correct. There are lots of variants of this question. That's actually simpler than this. No, this is No, the game That backwards induction solution is pretty easy. Anyway. Okay. So um, I want to prove I want to prove what's called a profit inequality. It's called a profit inequality because I'm going to compare uh, my, my gambler to a prophet who knew what the realizations were going to be. Okay? If you knew what the realizations were going to be, you get the expected maximum prize. Right? I claim that the gambler's prize for a threshold strategy T, if he chooses T such the probability that he gets no prize at the end of the day is exactly one half then the gambler's prize for special strategy T is at least the profit's prize divided by two. It's a two approximation. Okay. Oh, this is a huh? Yeah. Yeah. So why do I like this? Well, it's pretty simple. One number. It's robust because this probably get no prize condition doesn't change as a function of the ordering of things or the distribution above the threshold I use. If I change that distribution above the threshold, nothing happens to the, the thing I should do, my suggested uh, strategy. Um, and uh, also, when we see the proof of this, we'll see that the result we get is invariant to what I call the tie-breaking rule. What is the tie-breaking rule? It is, suppose there are multiple prizes that meet my condition that they're bigger than T. Well, the gambler takes the first one, but actually the theorem doesn't matter which one he t the gambler takes. Okay? So it's going to be invariant to that tie-breaking rule, which is going to make this theorem really useful for talking about auctions. Okay, so um, I'm going to prove this theorem to you in this one slide. Uh, I need some notation. So let's call the probability that the value is less than some threshold QI. Uh, the probability you never stop is the probability that all the prizes are less than the threshold. So that is the product of the QIs. Okay, I want to get now an upper bound on the profit, uh, which is the expected max. Um, Okay, so I'm first going to, if I didn't have this plus here, I would have done nothing. I just pulled out a T and subtracted a T. Okay, so now I'm going to just make sure this is positive or non negative. Okay, so now it's only bigger. Okay, so expected max is less than that. Okay, um, now I'm going to bound the expected max from the expected sum. And that is the upper bound I want on, on the on the profit. Good. I'm now going to ask uh, to get a lower bound on the prize the gambler uh, gets with their threshold strategy. Okay. So, good. The probability we never stop is x. So, the probability we do stop is 1 minus x. If we stop, we get a prize that's at least t. So, we get at least this. Right? Good. But, of course, we don't get just t, we get some higher value from that. We get the value that we stopped with. Um, but that's going to be hard to keep track of if there are multiple values above the threshold. So I'm going to look at the case where there's only one value above the threshold and add that in. But if there's more than one, I'm not going to add that in. So I'm going to add in the extra payoff I get from the case there's only one value above the threshold. And that's why I say it's invariant to the tie-breaking rule. Because if there are multiple prizes, I just assume I get T, which didn't care about the tie-breaking rule. So let's write that out. <clears throat> okay, so what is my contribution from prize I 
in the case it's the only one above the threshold? Well, it's the um, expected positive value of prize i conditioned on all others being below the threshold times the probability that all others are below the threshold. Right? That's the contribution to prize i from the only thing I'm allowing myself to keep track of, which is the extra difference I get above t um, when there's only one prize above the threshold. Wonderful. Um, this is the product of the q's, not including i, um, which is bigger than x because x also has qi multiplied by it. So I can simplify this equation by factoring out x to get this. The thing I'm conditioning on here is independent of the thing, my random variable, so I can drop my conditioning. Right? These prizes are all independent, not identical, but uh, independently distributed. So I drop my conditioning, and I get this. And now I do what I said. I set x equal to 1 half, and I compare my lower bound with my upper bound. Okay. Super cute little theorem. Um, really useful in approximation and auctions. So the next thing we're going to do is going to see sort of why. Okay, so the thing I want to do is solve this gen general unit demand pricing problem. Where I'm using the term pricing quite literally, I'm including randomized pricing, pricing lotteries in there too. It's not just pricing items. Okay, a single unit demand consumer and items for sale. I have a product distribution where consumer values are drawn, and I'd like the optimal mechanism uh, for this distribution. Okay, um, as usual, when trying to optimize, uh, when things are complicated, the optimal thing is complicated, it's hard to show approximation bounds. So how are we going to do that? Um, I'd like to get an upper bound on it that I do understand. So here's a, a question that I want to ask. I want to compare two problems. And... Um, for this, let's just think about item pricing instead of general pricing over lotteries. The unit demand problem, which is constrained to be deterministic, versus take the same information, but just imagine instead of having uh, this being the, the, the values of the same player for different items, it's the values of different people for one item. Well, then I have an auction problem, right? So I can ask the kind of funny question of, would you rather for the same distribution over this multidimensional value? Would you rather be selling to one player or selling to many players? And intuition should suggest that you'd rather many players because of competition. Exactly. Um, so the intuition is I'm going to be able to get an upper bound on that from this. And that upper bound is correct for deterministic mechanisms. It is not correct for randomized mechanisms. And that's kind of an interesting oddity um, that uh, if, you, if you think about it, you can relate back to stuff that Sergio was talking about. Imagine it was additive, not unit demand. Right? Then if I had individual people, I'd monopoly price each person and sell them their good. Right? And if I have one person, I can just price the bundle and take advantage of concentration. Right? So that's an example where um, bundling is good. And bundling is kind of like lotteries in the unit demand case. Right? I could do a lottery where you get probably one over n of each item, uh, one over m of each item, and that's a, the same as the grand bundle for additive values. Right? So these kinds of things come up um, that you have in both settings. Um, the same distribution, and they're both uh, independent but not identical. Okay. So yeah, my original problem was pro a, cr a product distribution. Okay. Um, so I'm keeping the same product distribution. I mean, you could ask this in general, yeah. right? Um, and in general, it's an upper bound for item pricing. Because, okay. yeah, I don't use that. I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you basically say, look at any item pricing, 
let's turn it into an auction that does that but only gets higher prices because of competition. Okay, you can. So then, then you see that this is bigger than that. But um, that breaks down for randomized mechanisms and it super breaks down for correlated distributions, whereas Sergio said, um, the, you can get unboundedly be better uh, revenue from lotteries, from ridiculous lotteries, an infinite number of lotteries, than you can with a finite deterministic menu of outcomes. Right, so for correlation. Okay, so here's my approach. I'm going to look at this, what I call the simple single dimensional analogy. I'm going to call it the representative environment, okay, where I take my unit demand players and I replace them with a bunch of single dimensional representatives, but these single dimensional representatives bid against each other. Okay, so you imagine this unit demand person hired uh, M different people for their different items, but those people don't know not to bid against each other. Okay, so then you have the single dimensional analogy. Um, what I want to do is I want to show that the optimal single item auction, I can bound that by some factor alpha above the multidimensional pricing. So what I'm going to actually show is alpha equal to two, so twice the optimal auction in the single dimensional environment exceeds the optimal randomized mechanism when there are product distributions. Okay, that's great because thanks to the theory of single dimensional agents, we understand this really well. Okay, um, I'm then going to give a reduction I'm going to show that multidimensional pricing is always better than single dimensional pricing. In other words, if I gave you that same analogy before where I said I have a bunch of players here uh, who are single dimensional and I have one unit, dem uh, unit demand player here, which would I rather be if I'm required to just post prices? And notice that I can't take advantage of competition with a single player, with the single dimensional players, if I post prices, right? And when I say post prices, I mean I post prices and then, and I'm gonna, the definition I'm gonna use, which uh, is that we get sort of the worst possible price. The person who has the lowest price who wants to buy, buys. Okay, then definitely this is better than this because here I get at least the worst possible price if someone wants to buy, he buys his favorite item, value minus price, right? Which is better than the revenue I would get here with the worst possible price. Okay, and then I need to instantiate this reduction by showing just analyzing a single dimensional problem. In the single dimensional problem, I need to show that a single dimensional problem is at least a beta fraction of an auction problem. Okay, so I want to show that single dimensional auctions approximate multi dimensional pricings. I then um, use this reduction that I sort of informally argue, but I'm not going to go into in more detail because I think it's fairly straightforward. Um, and I need to instantiate it by showing that single dimensional pricings are a good approximation to single dimensional auctions. So I'm going to start with this and then do this. Okay. Okay, of course, if I show this, then multi dimensional pricing is an alpha beta approximation. I'm going to show this with beta equal to 2 and alpha equal to 2. I'm going to get a 4 approximation. Okay, when is posted pricing a good approximation? So I'm doing, we were talking about multi-dimensional mechanism design, but now we're answering four, which is a purely single dimensional question. How does single dimensional pricing compare to single dimensional auctions? Well, single dimensional auctions are better, but maybe not that much better. Okay, here's the claim. For a single item, single dimensional linear agents posting a uniform virtual price such that the probability that the player does not, no, no one wants to buy, is exactly one half is a two approximation. How do you think I prove this? Profit inequalities. I'm going to apply profit inequalities. I'm going to tie break by, uh, apply profit inequalities to virtual values. And that gets a thing you do, and I tie break by minus price. Okay, so you get the worst possible price that you could possibly get. Okay, <clears throat> so what happens in property qualities? I have prizes, thresholds, maximum prize, which I'm comparing to, and the prize that I get with my threshold. And in the, in the optimal auction, which is, 
Are we talking about, no, this should be the optimal auction, not sacrifice with reserves. The optimal auction, I have virtual values. I have, this should be posted pricing. Sorry, in posted pricing, what do I have? I have virtual values. I'm posting a uniform virtual price. Um, I like to compare with the optimal virtual value, the virtual value that's highest, right? Um, but instead, I'm going to get the minimum price that's uh, the minimum, the, the worst virtual value. Okay? So basically, you sort of connect back and forth between the two settings, and you get this theorem out of it. Okay? Of course, if players are, I, are not IID, constant virtual prices correspond to different prices for different players in the single dimensional agent setting. Okay, good. But this is just a theorem that I was using to help me get a multiplayer result. Um, the nice thing is, is that it turns out analyzing single player settings is really helpful in doing, getting these multiplayer uh, results. Okay, so uh, I have to do the very last thing, which is to show that twice the revenue of the optimal auction for, a, for the single dimensional agent representative environment is at least the revenue of the optimal complicated thing for lotteries for unit demand player. So here's how I'm going to do that. I'm going to define an amortization of revenue. And remember, amortized surplus always exceeds revenue for any IC mechanism. Okay, for showing this bound, I'm not going to need to prove that optimizing it gives me IC. I'm just going to use it as an upper bound. Okay, the optimal amortized surplus is an upper bound on revenue. Good, now I have an upper bound on revenue. As I said in the previous part, the first thing I need to do in creating an approximation is get an upper bound. Okay, and here is the amortization of revenue I'm going to use. On the favorite item, the virtual value is going to be the single dimensional virtual value. On all other items, the virtual value is going to be the value of that item. Okay, I claim I already proved that this is an amortization of revenue. Let's think about a path that is horizontal meaning type one is changing and all other types are staying the same. What we said is if we're on a path, virtual values are the virtual values of their induced distribution. The virtual value of a constant is that constant, right? It's that value minus something with the distribution. There's no distribution, it's just the value. Okay, so on this path, the virtual value of all the other items is the constant. The virtual value of the higher item is just the induced distribution virtual value. So it's the distribution of the Favorite item. Okay, that's how I solved the path. Good. Now I'm going to use the following theorem. If I have a vector field, which is an amortization on a partitioning of type space into pieces, and it's an amortization of each piece, then it's an amortization of the whole thing. Right? And that's because the IC mechanism for the whole thing has to be IC on the piece. Right, so if it, if, if it correctly analyzes revenue for IC things on the path, right, then it correct, uh, then it lower bounds revenue for the take the take an IC mechanism for the whole space, restrict to the path. This thing gives me the revenue. Okay, therefore this thing gives me the revenue for the whole space, taking expectations. Okay, and that consistency problem we worried about before, we don't care about because we just want an upper bound. We don't care if things are consistent across paths. Good, so that's my amortization of revenue with a hand wavy argument of why it's correct. Um, what I'm gonna do is optimize this, but I wanna compare it to something I see. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split this amortization of revenue into two pieces. The favorite item piece and all the other items piece. So split it into two, and now I'm just gonna say, well, optimize, you had a unit demand constraint to optimize them together. I'm gonna let you optimize with separately the favorite item piece, and then optimize again the non-favorite items piece. That only gives you more flexibility, right? So let's now look at the amortized surplus from just the favorite item in the best possible way. What is that? Well, I sell the favorite item 
and I get the virtual value of that favorite item, that's just the mechanism that always sells the favorite item. That's just the second price auction. That's the revenue of the second price auction. Uh, but I sell the favorite item only if it's got positive virtual value. So that's the second price auction with a reserve later that says if you, if you aren't positive virtual value, I just throw you away. Okay? So it's a second price auction with lazy reserve. Okay? Um, what about the other one, the non-favor items? So for every type, the virtual value of the non-favor item is equal to the value of the second highest bid. So what is that virtual surplus? It's just the expected second highest bid. Oh, the second price auction gets that revenue. Okay, so now we have two auctions for the representative environment. One of them bounds the revenue of one of the coordinates and the other bounds the revenue of the other coordinates. So the combined revenue is at least the amortized surplus. Okay. So optimal revenue is less than amortized surplus, which is less than twice. Well, I had two particular auctions. That's less than twice the optimal single dimensional revenue. So there I have the bound I wanted to prove. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so I just wrapping up. Um, so uh, we've given a single dimensional nonlinear uh, theory of mechanism design that really is using it basically at every step uh, all of the ideas we knew in the single dimensional uh, linear case. And the mechanisms we get out look just like single dimensional linear mechanisms a lot of the time. And when they don't, we can approximate them by things that look like single dimensional linear auctions. Um, and uh, so that's sort of uh, what we did here. Yeah. We know that these sort of simple mechanisms are at least a poor approximation of sort of the maximum feasible revenue. Do we know how close that is to, I mean, on average, just drawing a bunch, just uh, take a bunch of random distributions, calculate what the optimum actually is, and sort of see how far away is this poor approximation from the optimum. I wouldn't want to do that as a theoretician. I might be happy doing that sort of empirically, like pick a distribution yeah. and draw this and see what it is. Um, the thing I think is interesting from a theory point of view um, is the following. We've shown that these mechanisms are uh, optimal in ideal settings. If I have nice distributions, ratio monotone, I don't have nonlinearity, things are optimal. So what these results you can view is saying is, as things degrade, as you get from these ideal settings to more and more realistic settings, there's actually a uniform bound that never degrades too much. Okay, that's sort of how I would view this. Okay, and then to answer your question, sure, if I draw distributions that are more like the ideal ones, I'm gonna get a much better bound. If I draw conditions that are more like, you know, worst cases for these theorems, I'm gonna get a worse bound. Okay, you might ask a question of tightness. Is this for approximation tight? The answer is not known to be tight. Uh, this is the best known bound, but it's not known to be tight. And there are awesome, interesting questions about tightening this for special cases. One of my favorite special cases is the case where the items are IID, uh, but from an arbitrary distribution, not necessarily one that induces uh, the product distribution of IIDs is not necessarily ratio monotone. Okay, and so, that should give a much better approximation factor. What is it? That's one of my favorite open questions. And I think the, the question of exactly answering these, getting these constants is an interesting question. The math tends to get hard really fast. And, and therefore, I'm not sure how much brain power we should try to spend on getting exact constants. Um, more than just saying, hey, never, things never get too bad. It's a four approximation. So if we squint our eyes, things look kind of like they look in the revenue linear case. And if we hope we're kind of closer to the ideal thing, then it's even better than a four approximation. Yeah. But do we know some bounds uh, are, that it cannot be better? So do you know that there cannot be a two approximation? Or something? Are there lower bounds? Uh, yes, there's a lower bound of two. Okay. Uh, in fact, the, the, uh, the profit inequality result, just the posted pricing, this thing has a lower bound of two. 
And it's really easy to come up with that. Okay, and so then that lower bound extends to all the places where I used it. And you actually can come up with examples that match the bound. Okay, so somewhere between two and four. Uh, sorry, for the symmetric case, it's not two. Uh, for regular, for irregular distributions, for regular symmetric case, it, it could be less than two. The lower bound is one minus one over e for regular cases for this theorem. Regular ID of this theorem. Anyway, um, uh, as I said at the beginning, I have a textbook which covers this stuff sort of in much more detail than I was able to cover here. These are just sort of some salient points of it um, where I talk about all the different kinds of bounds you can get under different assumptions and um, it's sort of apparent where the open questions are because I leave gaps in the theorems. 